welcome to this final presentation of the entire conference. Uh, it, thank you for making it this far. You, are, you have staying power. That's, that's a good thing. It's a really good thing. Uh, I am going to talk to you about the myth of the magical messaging fabric. My name is Jacob Crow. Who am I? Why am I here? Why are any of us here? These are deep and philosophical questions. Best left for the pub immediately after this. Uh, I'm in, my name is Jacob Corrib, as, as it shows here. Uh, I'm an independent consultant. I've been working in messaging and integration for the last many years. Uh, and I, through that time, I have worked with many companies. Many companies that uh, set up various systems, and when they don't work the very first time, they discard them. And they put in new systems that they don't really understand either. And it really does come down to this kind of lack of understanding. So by, by picking up individual problems and then moving to, moving to other platforms, they find themselves with a whole set of different problems that they didn't have the first time around. So what I'd like to do today, in, as this last final presentation of the day is to shed some light on an on a area that few people like really think about. Really think about, and that's messaging. But before we do, let's, let's talk about myths. This is one definition of a myth. It's an idea or a story that is believed by many people but is not true. I think that's a little bit simplistic. And I think it's quite dismissive of myths and the purpose that they serve. I actually prefer a different definition. It's a usually traditional story of semi-historical events that unfolds part of the world view of a people or explains a practice, belief, or natural phenomenon. So myths are stories about our world that are partially informed by our experience, sometimes that of others and they help to guide us. And it's the usefulness of this particular guidance which is why humans have always told myths. Because they have a grain of truth in them that fills in the gaps of our experience. Let's talk about mythology. Mythology comes from two Greek words, mythos and logos. Logos, logical thing approaches the world scientifically and empirically. It looks at explanations guided by things that you can be ver that can be verified through through facts, through experiments, through deduction. So truth that's discovered through logos seems to tries to be objective and universal. You get logos through things like time, experience, reading the documentation. Mythical thinking, on the other hand, approaches the world through less direct means, uh, more intuitive means. Truth discovered through mythos is more subjective and it's based on individual feelings and experiences. We only have a partial grasp of objective truths so we fill in our gaps with mythos. Uh, in IT, we are not immune to this. We get answers, we find answers on Stack Overflow to the wrong questions. <laughs> we half read tech articles. And we go to glossy conference presentations. So, the purpose of this talk is, is about messaging the movement of data between systems through the use of an intermediary. So messaging is not glamorous. It's half-jokingly referred to as plumbing. And that's a shame because plumbing is extremely useful. Yeah? And it's integral to everything that we do. We all have a limited amount of time and attention. And in an industry that's as fashion-driven as ours, where everything is superficially is moving so rapidly, it's quite normal for people to focus on the shiny technologies. Yeah. Partially because they're cool, fair enough, and partially 
so as not to be left behind. So the things that are most ordinary don't necessarily get the attention that they deserve. And so we forget that, that they're there while we're busy doing other things. The, the people who looked into these things in detail move on, and they leave everyone scratching their heads with, uh, with you know, half-remembered stories about how these pieces of infrastructure should work and what to expect from them. So it's not uncommon to hear things with messaging, such as, we will never lose messages. <laughs> messages will be processed in order. <laughs> Adding consumers will make the system go faster. Of course it will, right? <laughs> messages will be delivered once in only once. Now we should just be able to add this extra million messages a day and everything's going to be fine. And it starts from this particular lie. It's just a pipe. So this is usually where the hand waving starts, but if you look closely, there's a lot more going on inside there than meets the eye from the outside. So by telling these stories, we assign something that is everyday and functional mythical properties. <laughs> Inevitably, later on, usually in production, we're disappointed by ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so to get past this state, we need to get a, a better understanding of what it is that we're actually working with. So whether a messaging platform can address your use cases and how it goes about doing it, depends on its underlying design and the trade-offs that its authors chose to make. Sometimes they are obvious. Other times you need to get a, a closer look as to what's going on underneath the covers. And this means drilling beyond the front page of the documentation and a few shiny conference presentations. So today I'm going to talk to you about two products that superficially play in the same space. The distribution of messages. Okay. They have deep differences of approach and target use cases. The purpose of my presentation isn't really to explain this to you, is isn't to explain these two products to you in detail, although we will be getting quite deep, but it's to highlight through their differences ideas that you need to be thinking about whenever you look at one of these platforms so that you have the tools to sensibly critique a messaging technology in the future. So let's talk about why we'd use a, a broker-based messaging system in the first place. We've got two systems. In order for one to talk to the other, they need to agree on an interface. So far, so non-contentious. They agree on a contract, and you can change the implementation of it over time. Computer Science 101, it's not, it's pretty sad in practice. So by adding an intermediary into the, the middle, we're actually separating the two systems even further. Not only by interface, which is given, but by time. The consumer of a, of a message doesn't need to be there when the producer sends the message in the first place. I think of this as a, as a post office system. If I want to mail a parcel, the person to whom I'm sending the parcel doesn't actually need to be at home in order for me to send it. Make sense? So let's take a look at ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ stands in the corner of traditional messaging systems. What are its goals? It is a free, open source JMS implementation. It is a general purpose messaging broker, which allows clients to interact through multiple protocols. So the way that, that it is structured is over two places. You have a broker on one side, which is actually doing message distribution, but you also have a client side or a client library, which is something with the JMS API, that deals with the actual communication of a broker. As far as you're concerned, all you do is you simply send a message or receive messages. So what we what you cannot 
can't say definitively about any particular uh, messaging setup is whether or not it is correct by only looking at one site. People often come to me and go, can you just take a look at my broker configuration and tell me whether it works? Which my answer is, does it start up? Yeah, if it starts up, it works. Right? But how you're interacting with it and how you actually go about using it, which is all this side of the fence, will actually um, impact whether or not it, it does what it's supposed to do. So the, the client broker communications actually happen through a wire format. What exactly is this particular wire format? Well, wire formats exist so that you can connect. Uh, there are agreed upon protocols that allow you to connect between, uh, between various clients in the broker. So the default one is open wire. It is an internal one. It's, it's based in um, it, it's the thing that's actually been built up as part of ActiveMQ. You've got AMQP 1.0, uh, which is becoming a de facto standard within the industry at the moment. Uh, you have STOMP, which is a text-based messaging uh, messaging protocol, MQTT for IoT devices, XMPP if you've got like, something that talks to an analogy of a chat system, that's the way it works, and it's also got WebSockets. So you can actually have a JavaScript WebSocket client running inside a browser talking directly to a message broker, and then have a C++ client on the back of it uh, consuming those messages through AMQ. So ActiveMQ supports, go through those, two what are called messaging lines. First, the first one's point to point, or queues. So queues are a first and first out data structure that is durable. Durability is a quality of service. What it means is that uh, a consumer that goes away, when it comes back, it receives any messages that were sent in the meantime. Okay. Messages can be persisted by this pipe if the sender wishes them to be. Durability does not equal persistence. They are closely related, however. This is the domain that we're going to focus on, uh, as it's the one that we are most commonly interested in. The other domain is published subscriber, topics. Topics are non-durable. They're more like a conference call. When you're connected in, you hear everything that's being said. When you disconnect from the from the call, you miss anything that, that wasn't said when you reconnect, it's all the conversations moved ahead. Okay. These things can be made durable, so the consumer going away will receive messages later. And uh, durable subscriptions can also take advantage of persistence as well. Depending on the reliability that the producer asked for. So now that we've got some basic definitions, let's consider a trade-off that every single uh, single node system needs to make. And that is a trade-off between reliability and performance. So these are all uh, single node systems that that store things to disk. They, they all have this, this one particular uh, property about them. So whether it's a message broker or a regular database, they, they both have this particular concern. The JMS default is to actually set up, set an arrow and point it all the way to the reliability. Spectrum. But of course, you can move it all over to the to performance or somewhere in the middle, depending on your particular uh, mix and match of these, of these requirements. So, before we before we go on further, to, to deeper understand broker, we need to we need to understand a fundamental construct, and that is how exactly these things go about storing messages. For this, we need to look at the journal. The journal is a persistent data structure. It is made up of a number of files to which you append. Okay? It contains a history of the interactions. Again, as I said, spans multiple files. In the case of ActiveMQ, it stores messages and acknowledgments from consumers when they actually consume the message. Let's take a look at how messages actually get sent and what the interaction looks like. We have an application thread that comes along inside the producer and comes along and talks to the JMS API and says, I would like to send at which point in time a message is sent over to ActiveMQ, it is written to some sort of storage, and there is a confirmation step. The confirmation step is the longest, and I will get to it in a second. Afterwards, you get an acknowledgement coming back to the producer, and the producer's record can keep going. 
So this is a necessarily simplified, but still fairly decent working model of how, how a broker receives messages. The default storage mechanism in here uses a file system based journal. And it uses uh, an operation to ensure that what has been written to disk has actually made it to the disk. Hang on, you're kind of saying, but when I write something to disk, it's on the disk, right?
So how exactly does a transact the send work? Well, if you if you remember it, remember the previous diagram, every single send had an acknowledgement. Whereas with a transaction, I can send a number of different messages. I can say commit, and it's only at this point that the write confirm and acknowledge. What we've done is we've we've taken a number of individual writes, we've put them into one large write, we've just done it once. Okay? This gives us orders of magnitude performance gains as the client sends firstly our async and we're making better use of the disk dimensions. So this, this has some nice uh, side effects because it's also able to tie into broader transaction management APIs like JTA. On the consumption side, a consumer connects, it expresses demand, and ActiveMQ will page in a number of messages off disk from the journal. Okay. It will then dispatch them into an area called the prefetch buffer from which they will be consumed. At some point in time, you get an acknowledgement coming back and a deletion. Now, the relationship between these is actually configurable. The default mechanism, auto acknowledge, acknowledges the message as soon as the message has been handed off for consumption. So if you're con consuming thread through as an exception, too late, it's already been deleted. Sometimes you can tie these things into a, into a transaction so that acknowledgement follows consumption. A rollback follows consumption. Okay. Acknowledgements themselves are stored in the journals, and the deletion is only kind of uh, conceptual because there is a background thread that goes along and cleans up the journals. So if I have multiple consumers consuming from a broker, I have a number of messages that come in. What ActiveMQ will do is it'll round robin dispatch the message. If we have a situation where one of the nodes fails, then any messages that were dispatched to it, and when ActiveMQ detects a disconnection, will be re dispatched over to the second consumer. So, one of the interesting things about this is that this is a very simple consumption model, but it's a little bit too simple. Because the client only has to care about subscribing to actually receive the messages. And it's the broker's responsibility of keeping track of the consumption and the actual delivery. But what's interesting here is the actual timing of the failure that's happening on C1. Because a message may have been consumed as it's being processed, it hits a backend system, changes its state, and before it gets a chance to acknowledge, the node goes down. The same message gets re-dispatched over here, and the operation happens a second time. So you need some sort of item potent consumption or ability duplication to actually keep track that the messages are not processed twice. So the, the best that you can hope for in a queue-based system, don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise, is at least once message delivery. Which means there's no such thing as once in only words. <laughs> This has some fundamental implications about how we need to think about our message processing logic. Because okay? we've always assumed, oh, this is the message, the message will come down just once. Of course it's once. Not, not so much. So how exactly does how exactly do brokers deal with failure? Well, brokers, uh, brokers work analogously to, uh, to regular old school databases. You have a master and a slave, that's the typical setup. Um, the storage can only be used by one node at the same time, right? You can't have two things trying to overwrite the same, use the same files, because it will all end in disaster. There's no such thing as active, active, and active MQ. So we have two nodes, A and B. The first one to connect gets a lock on the store, and it becomes the master. Okay? The actual client is configured with a, a failover string, where it's saying, okay, connect to one, connect to the other, connect to one, connect to the other. The first one that actually has its port open, which is the master. It's only the master that ever opens its port. The client will actually consume into it and start sending and receiving messages backwards and forwards. When you get a, a second node coming up, it will periodically check and just say, hey, can I be the master? No, you can't. Someone has to go up. Can I become a master? No, you can't. And it will keep, keep doing this until the lock is released by the master through process termination or otherwise. So on a failover event, where this broker goes down, this node, it's been checking and it, it fails over and it, it actually resumes from where the other broker had left off. 
using the exact same journals, the same indexes, etc. The client, on the other hand, has been detected a disconnection and goes, oh, okay, well, I can't connect to A. I'll try B. B's not up yet. I'll try to connect to A. Absolutely. A is not there. I'll try to connect to B. Oh, B's there. Awesome. Now I can keep, keep going. Okay. So, with ActiveMQ, disk access matters. Aside from setting up the, the disks in such a way that they are shared, in, in a way that you can actually provide these network blocks, um, you need to ensure exclusive access to actually prevent side processes coming in and using the disk at the same time. So if I've got a database sitting on the same disk and someone, write, someone runs a database report, that's going to impact on the throughput going on on my broker because someone has hijacked the disk access. Okay? This is a massive problem in virtualized environments that don't have something called disk affinity or storage affinity that actually guarantees an exclusive pipe running from the actual process all the way down to the storage. So because of this, messaging is not a good fit for containers. Why? Well, fundamentally it needs a manual box setup. Aside, leaving aside the fact that you know, containers can also be moved around through processes like Kubernetes or otherwise. So, be careful when, when you are using uh, systems like these, because a broker can't just run anywhere. And the same is true of any database systems as well. If you're talking to a disk, don't stick it in a container. Uh, a, if for anyone who wants, wants a little bit more information on there's a great presentation from earlier this year by uh, the people from Salesforce. And what they did, they, their first attempt was to containerize everything. On the second pass, anything that touched disk, they just they set up manually on boxes, not remotely. So how do you scale this? Well, you can increase disk speed. The faster your disk, the faster it'll go. Okay. You can make better use of disk dimensions through things such as transactions, where we're actually combining writes, combining single writes into one big write. Or you can split messaging over multiple brokers. Well, what, what exactly do I mean? Well, this is what a lot of people do. I call it the big bag of messaging. Anything can talk to anything. I have four different systems, and they need to talk to each other through asynchronous messaging. I'll an active MQ in the middle, off we go. Yeah. <coughs> I talk about this diagram as a conceptual view. It actually doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if I replaced A and Q here with Oracle, would that be a single Oracle database? Probably not. Yeah. So think of ActiveMQ as a layer. It may be that, that some of these conversations need a dedicated logical broker, an HA pair or, or similar. So some thought is required. So what, what are some of the trade-offs around this? Well, it's a, it's a simple model, a little bit too simple. Because you can download ActiveMQ, you set it up in a box and it works. The first six months, until it stops working, no one has any idea why. It is transactional. And it has a rich set of supporting functionality, so things like built-in message routing and wiretapping. <laughs> The downsides of it are that the performance is pinned to disks. Fundamentally, it is just one of the, the design trade-offs there. It is impacted by the total load on the broker. Yeah. So if I have uh, a bunch of different queues, uh, and I have you know, a set of performance on one queue, if someone starts using another queue and floods the system with messages, because of the exclusivity, it will actually slow everything down. It requires non-transparent changes. So over time, you will get changing traffic volumes, you'll get a changing number of destinations, payload sizes may vary. Uh, there's a number of reasons why you may actually want to kind of go back and redesign the broker infrastructure after it's gone into production. And finally, it requires an understanding of what is going on. There's no, there's no magic here. You have to understand your tools. So, as a counterpoint, let's let's compare Kafka. Kafka represents the NoSQL of messaging. Yeah? 
If you take active MQ, and that's your view of active MQ, Kafka is 90 degrees to it. It was designed at LinkedIn to get around the problem of multiple separate data feeds. Okay. It's intended to address some of the shortcomings of active MQ, uh, namely around the need to not set up distinct brokers for different purposes. And its original use case was for things like moving logs, notification of UI activities, notification notes. So its goals were to be fast, very fast, handle huge volumes. How huge? If you're looking at millions of things a second, Kafka's looking to look at. Scale horizontally, support pub sub and point to point, and allow the no cost addition of consumers. So in ActiveMQ, where we're doing round robin dispatch, it, the more consumers I add, the slower the system goes, the slower dispatch goes. And finally, permit replays. This is not something that ActiveMQ does. To do this, they implemented a unified destination model, which I have called a Kafka topic. They refer to it as a topic, but it's confusing because there's another thing called a topic, which is something completely different. And it, a Kafka topic is both a topic and a queue. So for, a, for this, you have one journal with multiple pointers to internal locations. Unlike ActiveMQ, Kafka separates out different destinations, or different Kafka topics, into their own journals. Okay. So this pointer here, what exactly is this pointer? Well, it's my way of, of talking about it. In the documentation, it's referred to as a consumer group, with a group ID being spoken about in the code. And it corresponds to a single logical consumer, a system. So let's take a look at, take a look at the, the mechanics of the Kafka topic. Okay, here's a journal that's had some things written into it. A bunch of messages are in there. And a consumer comes along. It gets a, a pointer called System A, and it consumes out. Another system comes along and says gets a pointer called System B, that's its group by B, and it consumes all of the messages from the beginning. Or you can start from where you've what the current position in and take take messages as they come. These are different systems, not threads. So if I have one consumer and it's connected to Kafka, Kafka will feed a message. But what if I have two consumers with the same pointer, the same group ID, trying to consume from the same topic? Well, the second consumer to come around will actually get an exclusive hold on that and it will get the messages. This is, a, this is equivalent to exclusive consumption where the newest consumer takes over. It's got the highest priority. It's always got the highest priority. So this is completely different from JMSQs, which actually do the round robin message distribution. So what do, what do Kafka have to say? The, the people at Kafka have to say that, well, you have one consuming system, one consuming thread that takes messages. It puts it onto effectively and in memory queue and hands it out to various other threads in order to consume if you want to consume them in parallel. Okay. Um, there's only certain use cases that actually allow for this. A crash of, cons uh, of a consumer process will lose any messages that have been pulled in from the broker that may, may be in the process of, 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 being, um, of being executed. So th there is another option. And it's partitioning. Partitioning is fundamental to Kafka. So messages for one topic get split out over multiple journals, over multiple partitions. So these partitions can also be thought of as shards. So when I have two instances of a consumer process, the same consumer process, the same system, they each get assigned a different partition, and they consume their messages like this, one after the other. Not necessarily off the other, but uh, independently. <coughs> so each consumer instance controls its named partition and its assigned pointer. And its assigned, uh, sorry, controls its assigned pointer in, the, in the, its partition. So if I have more partitions that I have consumers, what will happen is that the messages come through from one and then from the other. So you've got multiple partitions being assigned to the same consumer. 
So how exactly does partitioning happen? Um, unlike ActiveMQ, where if you want partitioning, you know, you'd actually have to build it up at the application level, in Kafka, it's built in. Sort of. To look at partitioning, we need to understand that it's actually performed by the producer. Now, given that it's given that it's sent by the producer, let's let's define what exactly is it that we're sending. In ActiveMQ or in JMS, there's this construct called a message, which is an object with a, a map of properties and headers, and also a payload. In, Active, in Kafka, a message is a key value pair. The key is a business-specific grouping used for partitioning, and it corresponds to a set of messages that should be processed in order. Okay. So this might be an account number or a geographic reference or, or something similar. The value is the payload. So to partition, what you need to do is you need to have a function. They're given a message and the current cluster state around the particular topic. How many partitions are there? Or in the topic at this point in time? Return to me a partition. Okay. And that is the partition that I'm actually going to send to. That the consumer is, that the producer is going to send to. This, this function is implemented through an interface called a partitioner, which returns an integer, which is just the partition ID for this, for this particular topic. The default implementation here uses a hash function. Now, it's not typical, it's not untypical to get a, um, an uneven distribution of messages. Why? Firstly, keys aren't evenly assigned between messages. Okay? Secondly, given that it's a hash function, you get collisions in the actual hash function itself. So you, they, you get more messages assigned to certain buckets than others. Okay? So it's not, it's not perfectly evenly distributed in the same way that, that ActiveMQ is. So one of the interesting things about this is that um, you can also get, because we're looking at the, at the cluster state, the cluster state can change over time. So you can actually get in-order consumption problems when you add or delete a partition at runtime. So you it's typical to add partitions at runtime. So you might be assigning messages into partition A, and then for that same key, the hash function will return a different partition for the same keys when, the, when you've got more partitions added in the system. So what are some of the partitioning considerations that you might want to do? It's not typical to add new, uh, new partitioners, but if you, if you wanted to consider it, what, you, what would need to be done? Well, Related messages should end up on the same partition. That's your, that's a starting point. Uh, when you've got repartitioning events going on, there should be some sort of stickiness, so that the related messages still keep going to the same same one that they were going to previously. Which means that you need a shared state across producers. So if you've got different producer instances, then you've got to keep the partitioning state across all of them. So you might be using something like Hazelcast in addition to Kafka in order to get that, that distribution. As I said, most of the time the, the, default, the default behavior is fine. Sometimes it may not be. Why? Why do I care about this? Well, to support a fair distribution of messages to multiple consumers without incurring the cost of managing dispatch. So Kafka's not doing round-robin message distribution. It doesn't need to cycle through a number of producer, consumers. They each have their own pointers. They drain, they drain their partition. So it rephrases the distribution dispatch problem to one of partitioning and moves the responsibility of it away from the broker and onto your code. Ta -da! <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So um, what other complexity is there in actually sending messages? Well, when we send a message, we send this thing called a producer record, which is a key value pair. And what it returns to us is a future. Just not now. So the, what you're actually sending to is actually a buffer. And in the background, another thread goes off and it sends it off to Kafka. So you may be continuing on, and then your node crashes. You think you've sent it. Did you send it? Probably not. So um, can you replay? Mm, maybe, maybe not. So, but there are a number of different ways that you can kind of make this a little bit more reliable. So there's a number of ways to send it. The default mechanism is async. 
You can do async with a callback, so if you want to plug it into something like Vertex, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Or you might want to go the full sync, so you say get on the future, so you're actually waiting until you get confirmation back from, back from the broker. Okay. So, but that's all we have to worry about, right? Maybe. Uh, so, CAC is fast by default, but we can kind of bring it down towards reliability if we want to. We can do this by setting the buffer to zero, uh, making the, the send to the broker fully synchronous, so it's the same thread that's doing it, and waiting on the future. There's a bit more complexity than that, because on the consumption side, it's not as straightforward as just getting a message. And the trick is, is actually, there's a plural here. You can get multiple messages at the same time being sent to you when you hold. So it retrieves potentially multiple messages through the, through the same operation. So what happens when you hold? Well, the, the, the default behavior is equivalent to auto-acknowledge. We get a pointer, we move it, we feed it some messages, and the pointer will, at some point in time, which is independent of our code, actually uh, be committed. So if the node goes down, lost it. So a crash means a loss of, a loss of in-flight messages, because the pointer's already moved. The, the really insidious thing about it is that when another consumer comes along, it has no idea that a crash happened. All it knows is it has a point of position in a log and off we go, right? So consumption is, is fundamentally uh, non-transactional, but we do have this, this nice little thing that should have appeared later. Yeah? So you need to keep track of the last consumed point of position, which is the offset, and on partition assignment, Rewind to the last known offset. So there's a seek operation that you've actually worked. So you think of it as I'm controlling a pointer and I can actually move it backwards and forwards and replay and do all sorts of things. Alternatively, you can keep track of the messages that you process. And on partition assignment, rewind all the way back to the beginning, bring in all the messages and discard everything that you previously sent. This is something called the idempotent consumer pattern. Enterprise integration patterns to the rescue. Alternatively, you can handle acknowledgement yourself. There is a commit, so you can actually turn off the auto acknowledgement. And you can say, I'm going to do it myself. You say commit sync, or well, there's also an, an async option. But when you fail, what you do is you commit to the last OK position in order to roll back. There is no roll back. Yeah? You have to handle that yourself. So you say, what's the last committed position, consumer? Commit sync, commit on this partition to the previous, previous position. So that'll allow you to actually replay. You have to be careful here. There's no re-delivery or dead letter queue type situations as there would be in a traditional message broker, and no automatic rollback. Or you use, keep the consumer code simple and use the default behavior when some sort of message loss is accepted. Okay. These, these are the use cases that it was designed for, where some message loss is accepted. This is the A10 Thunderbolt, also known as the Warthog. It is the most survivable plane ever built. Yeah? It is used for close air support, tanks, vehicles, and ground targets. Uh, the Warthog is designed to fly with one engine, one half a tail, one elevator, half of a wing, and it can survive direct 23 millimeter anti-aircraft fire. That's like Kafka. <laughs> <laughs> Kafka gets, gets its reliability through redundancy. So when we actually send messages into it, uh, Kafka has this idea of a replication factor. ActiveMQ is the traditional kind of master-slave setup. Kafka's not like that at all. Kafka's cloud first. It's um, simple commodity hardware. As I said, it's the no SQL of messaging. So each Kafka topic has a leader and a number of followers. This is the replication factor itself, right? So there is replication that goes on between them. All the reads and writes for a topic partition end up going to the same leader. Okay? Through keeping track of what are called in-sync replicas, like who is currently up to date, anything that is currently up to date can start handing off messages, can take over as, as a leader. So you can lose all but one of these nodes, and it will still keep going. So it'd be great just to have a demo here of like 10 Raspberry Pis with a hammer. <laughs> that would be really expensive, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but um, 
if you imagine that, 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 that that's kind of a cool idea. Um, so all the reads and the writes go to the same leader. So the client sets up how many of these commit responses they're comfortable with. Okay? The more commit responses, the slightly longer it actually takes them to, to send it. Again, it's performance versus reliability. So the, the beauty about this particular setup is you don't need to have any particular number of, of uh, broker instances running, Kafka instances running. Because the same Kafka nodes can act as leaders for one partition and followers for another. Yeah? So here, Kafka 2 is the leader for the blue partition and a follower for the red partition. Which means that every single node can act as effectively a master at the same time. Yeah? So unlike master slave, where you've got like one node which is which is warm, and then you could go one time when it's not being used. Here, everything in the cluster is being used at the same time. The coordination is actually done through a system. Or is anyone uh, who, who, who doesn't know about Zookeeper? Who, who knows about Zookeeper? Who knows about Zookeeper? So, hands up, awesome. So Zookeeper was originally used for uh, Hadoop, but it's now used for a number of, different, uh, number of different systems. And it keeps track of the current nodes that are present for the broker, the topics in the partitions that are maintained, who is the leader, who is the follower, consumers, consumer groups, and which journal offsets in which partitions the various consumer groups are actually up to. Okay, so all of the all of the transient state is actually held, held in Zookeeper, and that's kept through quorum-based replication. Now the implications of this is because you're not doing syncs, you get up to three orders of magnitude faster performance out of any individual node than you would out of an academic queue. There's no need for a, a shared hardware, and there's no need to sync. So what, what are the trade-offs, the positive ones? Well, it's easily scalable, just add nodes. It's the high throughput due to the resiliency design. I'm just waiting for acknowledgments from n number of nodes. Right? Uh, and it's easy to run on commodity infrastructure. Scaling out partitioning gives us a massive amount of, uh, of throughput capability. There's always downsides. It's non-transactional. And there's lots of client complexity that you need to re-implement across systems and languages. Who works in an environment where they only use Java? <laughs> Python, Ruby, Node, whatever. You implement the same logic in one, you implement logic in one, you've got to implement logic in the others as well. And it requires an understanding of the internal mechanics and some upfront thought in order to get right. For the eagle-eyed, you'll see that the third point is common to ActiveMQ and Kafka. There's no escaping it. You need to actually understand what's going on. So what exactly works for you? Well, when would you use ActiveMQ? When you've got high individual value messages. Transactionality is built in. It's nice and easy, nice and simple. You might want to have non-durable pub sub. Disk is cheap, but it's not free. Has anyone seen an AWS bill? They're really expensive. Uh, you can use a broker as a transport bridge. As I said, you can have a JavaScript client running in a web browser, talking to a C++ client in AMQP, with ActiveMQ in the middle. It supports things like request reply over messaging, which is actually really, really useful for certain, for certain instances. Uh, it has some simple message routing, or, you know, or you want to use, you want to span multiple geographical locations, so you have geographical broker networks. When you use Kafka, well, typically you use it when you have messaging that's valuable in aggregate. And it's the opposite use case of ActiveMQ, where the set of data is more useful than any one particular piece of it. The, the thing about data is the more you have of it, the less valuable any one piece of it is. Where you have huge throughputs of data, or you might, might be using something like event sourcing. So anyone familiar with event sourcing? Yeah, a few, a few undecided handfuls. Um, hand, hands up. Um, the, with event sourcing um, is a, a style of application design where all the application state is treated as events. In order to build up from to the current state of the, the thing, you basically bring up a node, run through all the events, and you've now got an in-memory view of the current 
of the current state of the system. So the, the rewind mechanisms in, in, uh, in Kafka are very useful for this particular, this particular style of system, this particular style of application of that. So in short, the horses don't fly. <laughs> they, they really don't. Uh, neither platform will give you all of you know, transactionality, uh, consumer failure awareness, um, effortless scalability, storage transparency, and drop and go in production. Having said that, I think the most important thing in, in any tool is to understand. I've, I've shown you two, two different tools that are to be used in two different situations. And much like NoSQL didn't replace relational databases, it really filled, filled niches in certain use cases. In the same way, Kafka offers an alternative complementary tool set to, to regular broker-based messaging. So regardless of which system you use, invest some time in actually learning it and remember to use the, make sure that you use the right tool when it makes sense. As a party thought, more logos, less mythos. Thank you very much. If anyone wants to ask me any questions, uh, you can come up and ask me over here. Everyone else, you're free to go. Thank you for surviving. <laughs> It's been an awesome conference.